I'm pleased to announce and welcome our first driven president who stands up for his convictions, President George W. Bush. Thank you all. Thanks for the warm welcome. Be seated unless you don't have a seat. Mitt, thank you for that wonderful introduction. That tell us privilege on your I appreciate it. Appreciate your leadership. RGA, Alan Sunny. I call him uh, Big Buddy. He is a big buddy. And I want to thank Matt Williams as well for knowing him. And Ronnie, thank you all very much for taking a strong leadership role. One of the things you find in the success of governors is they hire you well. Same thing they have as presidents. And I am very good. I want to thank you all for supporting people who know how to get things done. You know, our line of work is a lot of talkers, sometimes you find the doers. A lot of people who have opinions, but oftentimes people can't roll up their sleeves to achieve, uh, achieve agendas. And the folks here support you here today are people who have a set agendas, make decisions based on principle, and get things done on behalf of our country by running the states. Thank you for supporting them. Thank the government for being such a strong leader. I, uh, I enjoy working with the governors. I know how these folks think. And they want to know that I know that we are a nation at war. They are. Uh, they are commander in chiefs of their respective national guard units, many of which have been deployed overseas. And I want to thank our governors and the first ladies for understanding the task ahead for our country, for supporting those who wear the uniform, and for reaching out to the families who worry about their loved ones. Our governors. These governors are on the front line in the war against terror, and I thank you for your steadfast support. They, like me, will never forget the lessons of September the 11th. Our nation must never forget the lessons of September the 11th for the greatest duty of our respective governments, federal government and state government, is to protect the American people. The security of our citizens is of paramount importance to my administration, to many in the Congress, as well as our governors. The way to win the war on terror is to stay on the offense, is to defeat the killers overseas so we do not have to face them here in America, is to be relentless in our pursuit. Never give in, never give up, and keep the, run, keep the enemy on the run, which is precisely what we're doing. In order to win the war on terror, it is really important for the President to see clearly and he says something, means what he says. And so when I said to the world, if you harbor terrorists, you're equally as guilty as the terrorists. I meant what I said, and the Taliban found out exactly the United States of America keeps its word. And today, because we have held that doctrine, America is a safer place. Al Qaeda no longer has a safe haven in which to plan and plot and attack, and 25 million people are enjoying the fruits of liberty. The lesson of September the 11th is that when we see a threat, we must take the threat seriously. A lot of us were growing up, oceans, uh, we felt oceans to protect us from harm. 
the software overseas, we can deal with it if you wanted to or not because we were safe. September 11th changed that forever. September 11th taught us that when we see threats moving or materialize, we must take them seriously. I saw a threat, the world saw a threat, people of both political parties in the United States Congress saw a threat, and that was Saddam Hussein. The world is better off without Saddam Hussein in power. Many of our governors have been to Iraq, and I thank them for supporting our troops in harm's way. We've got a strategy for victory in Iraq. Our strategy, our goal is to make sure that Iraq can govern itself and sustain itself and defend itself. We'll become an ally in the war on terror and not be a safe haven for Al Qaeda, which wants to plan and plot and use the oil wealth to strike America again. Our strategy is threefold. One will help rebuild the country so we can see the differences of democracy. Two, we'll encourage a political system that will take into account the voices of the people. You saw what I saw. Eleven million Iraqis made their voices abundantly clear we want to be free in the face of terror. They decided to vote in overwhelming numbers. The leaders of Iraq rejected it. This notion that uh, a, a suicide and a thug and a terrorist can create a civil war, they're interested in a unified government that will allow the people to express their will, a unified government that will give young mothers and fathers the hope that their children can grow up in a peaceful society. The third part of our strategy is to train the Iraqis so they can take the fight to the end, and that's exactly what's happening. The Iraqis are standing up, and that is the only group standing down. I know many of you are concerned about the truth levels. I know our government is worried about the truth levels in Iraq. Here's my response. I will determine the truth levels in Iraq, one necessary to achieve victory, based upon the recommendations of our commanders, not based upon politics in Washington, D.C. Ours is an enemy that has no conscience. But they do have a philosophy. They're totalitarian in nature. They're fascist in their tactics. They will spare no life in order to achieve their objective. Their aims are clear. They believe the United States is weak and flaccid. It's only a matter of time before we withdraw and create back the end of which their awful ideology and flow in which they achieve their objectives. They do not understand the United States of America. We will not flinch in the face of the terror. We will not let thugs and assassins determine the foreign policy of the United States. We will stay in the fight, and we will win the fight for the security of the United States of America. In the long run, in the long run, the way to defeat an ideology of darkness is with an ideology of hope and light. And that ideology is based upon liberty, the fundamental rights of men and women to live in a free society. I believe, I believe that deep within everybody's soul is the desire to be free. So I wasn't surprised when 11 million people voted. I wasn't surprised when the Afghans fought off the terrorists. I'm not surprised when people take the streets in Lebanon demanding freedom. Freedom is on the march. And by having freedom on the march, we're laying the foundation of peace for generations to come. It's not easy work. It's hard work. But this nation has done that kind of work. I want to remind you that after World War II, America didn't demand the world. We held our hand as we built to become a democracy. World War II and World War I cost our, cost our country dearly, and then our lives lost. But today, because we took the principle that liberty is universal and democracy is the peace, Europe is whole, free, and at peace. And in Japan, my dad went to get a year out of the the United States of America. The other day, some 60 years after World War II ended, I can sit down at the table with one of my close friends in the international arena, the Prime Minister of Japan, 
talking about keeping the peace. And what happened? Japan uh, took on a Japanese-style democracy. And that democracies and liberty convert enemies into allies in order to lay the foundation of peace for generations to come. This country of ours must never forget the lessons of history and be confident in the universal values that can change the world to be a peaceful world. And my fellow governors understand it. And I appreciate your courage. And I appreciate your strong support, and I appreciate your steadfast will in the face of in the face of the enemy. And here at home, we've got a strong agenda as well. And it was right. We've, uh, this economy of ours has overcome a lot. It's overcome recession, and war, and terrorist attacks, and corporate scandals, and hurricanes, and high energy prices. Yet we're strong, and we're getting stronger. And one of the reasons why is we understand that when you let people keep more of their own money, they will save and spend and invest and cause this economy to get going. Our economy grew at 3.5% last year. Unemployment is 4.7%. We've added 4.7 million new jobs since August of 2003. Productivity is on the rise. Home ownership is at an all-time high. More minorities own a home today than ever before in our nation's history. And yet there's times of uncertainty. There's competition in the global economy. People are changing jobs quite often. It's kind of an unsettling feeling here. United States of America, and the fundamental question is what do we do as we get into the future? Some say let us retreat, let's isolate ourselves from the world, or let's protect ourselves with artificial walls. That's not the attitude of me or our governors. We're confident about the future because we intend to shape the future and keep the United States of America as the leading economy in the world. Keep this economy going. We've got to keep pro growth economic policies in place, not only at the federal level, but at the state level. You know, there's a lot of talk here in Washington about the deficit. I'm concerned about the deficit, too. Don't fall prey to those who say all you got to do is raise the taxes and balance the budget. That's not how Washington works. Here's the way Washington works they're going to run up their taxes and then figure out new ways to spend the money. The best way to deal with them. But the deficit is keep taxes low. Congress needs to make the tax relief permanent. On one hand, you have pro-growth economic policies that create economic wealth, generate new revenues for the Treasury. On the other hand, you've got to be wise about how you spend your money. I'm looking forward to working with Congress on yet another lean budget that focuses on priorities. A budget that doesn't try to be all things to all people. A budget that recognizes we can cut our deficit in half by 2009 if we're fiscally sound with your money and the governors understand fiscal sanity. And I appreciate the surplus that you have. Don't be calm on us spending more money. Keep this economy strong. We got to make sure we have a flexible economy. We got to and, 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 and make this economy stay. That, the most competitive kind of common in the world, we've got to be smart about legal policy. We've got too many lawsuits in the United States of America, junk lawsuits that are driving capital away from job creation. We strongly believe in legal reform in order to make sure this economy remains the best economy in the world. I thank our governors for court reform. we got a problem. We're hooked on oil. I'm surprised I'm not going to hear a text and say that. But if we want to be the leading economy in the world, we have got to spend money on research and development. It gets us off oil. Oil creates an economic problem for us because of rising demand in places like China and India. Relative to the supply of oil, it causes the, your prices of gas to go up at the pump. That hurts our economy. Dependency upon oil also creates a national security issue. Let me put it bluntly. Sometimes we rely upon oil from people that don't like us. 
and therefore in order to make sure we're not only competitive, but to make sure we're nationally secure, we have got to figure out new ways to power our automobiles, ways like ethanol and high plug-in hybrid battery vehicles, and to make sure that we're less dependent on oil. We've got to have clean coal technology, nuclear power, as well as solar and wind power. This administration looks forward to working with the government to get us unhooked from foreign sources of energy. Man, I got a lot to say tonight, except the bar said keep it short. The wise man always does his thing on that. I do want to share one concern about that. And that is, unless they're children, they're well grounded in math and science. The jobs of the 21st century are going to go elsewhere. And our governors understand that. Governors also understand that it's important for this federal government, as well as private companies, to. Uh, invest in research and development so that we're always on the leading edge of technological change. And so I propose to the Congress that we all with a federal funding for basic research and physical sciences. And I'm saying to Congress as clearly as I can, let's make the research and development tax credit a permanent part of the tax code so our corporations can accurately plan for investment that is necessary to make sure America is the most competitive nation in the world. Finally, I look forward to working with our governors to make sure the No Child Left Behind Act is fully totally implemented. The No Child Left Behind Act says, first of all, these guys know what to do when it comes to running the schools. We believe in local control of schools. But it does say, in return for federal money, we expect there to be high standards and measurement to make sure every child learns how to read and write and add and subtract. And if we find a child who cannot read and write, early on,